Good evening. No, I know, okay. Um, Y'all know who Corey Johnson is? He preached here a couple of times. Okay, so Corey and I had this conversation. Um, I was watching back through the, uh, the Noah series that he did. It was Noah, right? Yeah, Noah series. And, and as I'm watching it on YouTube, like, that's the exact face that I pictured as he's preaching. And so I'm going to need a little bit more interaction. Or we will be here for four hours. My name's Adam. Guys aren't, we're we're, we're going to work on this. And by God's grace, by God's grace, um, you'll see me more often here in the next couple of months. Um, I'm super excited to be here. I'm not super excited about these faces, though. <laughs> i got to be real honest. Like, There's a glorious Jesus, a Jesus that has saved us. There's, there, we're part of a, a story. We should be filled with joy. We should be, we should be just exuberant. Yeah. Excited. Yeah. Thank you. I was waiting for somebody to give me a little love, man. All right, so here's the deal. Um, my name's Adam. Uh, my wife is Taylor. She's sitting over here. Um, she's gorgeous and she's beautiful. Um, and we are super excited um, to be here tonight. Man, this thing's going to kill me. Excuse me. We're super excited to be here tonight, and we are super excited to engage in God's story with you for those who don't know him yet. That's really what we're, we're here for, right? That, that's what we're here as Christians for, to engage in God's story for those who don't know him. We're not here so that, that we feel the goodies because we came here. We're not here because, you know, for some reason we, we feel some mandate to be here. At the church at Bevo, where I'm currently pastoring, they've got like this big uh, microphone. It kind of looks like Garth Brooks or Britney Spears before she shaved her head. So this one's, this one's causing me some problems. But we're not here for us. We're here for the people that we love that don't know Jesus. And so... If you've been with us, how many people have been with us? How many are, are new here? You can raise your hands. It's okay. Like, we're going to work on participation. I promise you we're going to keep doing this and doing this. I don't know. How many have been here? How many have been here? Okay, we've all been here. I'm sorry I don't know you. I'm excited for you to hear my story. Um, but I, I don't know you. And um, so I'm going to run it back just for those who don't know kind of exactly where, where we got to get here. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll get a better understanding about what Jesus is teaching us. So we're in the Summer, of the Ma- Summer on the Mount series. And the first part of the Summer on the Mount, the first sermon that, that Tim taught was the Beatitudes. And what the Beatitudes were, were what does the kingdom, what does the church look like when the Spirit starts, starts to move and the Spirit starts to empower? And we started hearing these things like we need to be meek. Blessed are those that are meek. We started hearing these things that don't necessarily reflect the culture view of strong. We started hearing these things that that started to challenge who we are in light of who the culture tells who we are. And so all of you were sitting here with those same looks on your face as if, man, I don't know really what this is going for. But this is what Jesus wants his church to look like. And this was the Beatitudes. And so that's the, the what. If you're here for very long, you're going to hear that uh, Tim likes to use the words indicative and imperative because he's an old English teacher. Old is a qualifier there. And so the next sermon that we hear is that we're going to be salt to the world. And, and, and this idea of salt is really... Um, big in my heart. So if you come and hang out with me and I get to share my story, what you're going to find out is that I love to cook. Like I'm an amateur culinary guy. I'm, I'm cooking all the time. And one of the things that you find in the culinary arts is that salt enhances the flavor. Right? Has anybody ever tasted some food that didn't have salt? It's terrible. You will never get that at the Gray House. The Gray Household always has salt in abundance. 
And we found out where city on a hill gets its name. It's this passage that we're to be a, a city on a hill. We're supposed to be separate from the culture but deeply engaged. And so what we learned about that is that Christians by mandate from the very beginning should make the creative and excellent art in bringing forth a redeemed culture. And basically what that means is we as Christians should have the best parties. We shouldn't have the long faces. We shouldn't be sitting here trying to figure out what's going on. We should be excited and we go to work. We should be the ones who want to work the hardest because we're working to the glory of God. When we cook, we should cook with the best food and the best things. And when people come to us to eat out our food, they should have smoked meat off my smoker. My new egg. It was just so my wife knows. That's why I keep buying all of this meat and all of these tools, right? Because I need them. True story. And so we learn the why because we want to be, we want to, we want the world to see that we believe so much in our God, that we are so excited about the work that he's doing, that we want to share that with everyone. We want to be a salt to the world. We don't want the world to be like, man, here comes those church cats. Probably aren't going to tip me anything. Here comes those church people. Stingy. They never have any of the good beer. That's not what Jesus has called us to. He's called us to excellence. And so we start to get our identity. We're called to a meekness. We're called to some beautiful descriptions in the Beatitudes. And, and then we're called to excellence so that the world can see the glory of God. And so Jesus in this teaching, he's, he's teaching us about how we should be and who we, who we should be. And, and what does this look like when the Spirit starts to wrap our, our hearts around his mission and, and our minds start to change what he loves and what he wants and not what we want. But he knows, ultimately, that he's talking to some Jewish folks. Now, the Jewish folks have been trying to follow these same Ten Commandments over and over and over again. You guys know Ten Commandments, right? Charleston Heston, three hours long, world's boringest movie on the planet, does not sit on the excellence chart. I'm just kidding. If you really like it, I'm, I'm too long for me. I can't handle it. But you know that, right? Well, here's what you don't know. There's 613 commandments in the Old Testament. And, and the entire Old Testament is about these Israelites that are going over and they're attempting to follow the law. They're attempting to follow God's word. They're attempting to do these things and they fail over and over and over again. And God swoops back in and he starts to bless them and they start to do a little better. And about 12 seconds later, they forget that God is God and they run towards something else, usually a stupid golden calf. Don't understand it. Not my culture. Golden calf. Here's your God. Nah, not really me, right? And so this Old Testament is, is going on and on again. And what's that created in their hearts is, is if I can only follow these Ten Commandments to the letter of the law, then I'm good. Right? So can you follow the, the Ten Commandments? Well, we learned last week. Murder, right? How many of y'all have killed anybody lately? You killed somebody? Oh, so you heard the sermon. You were in this, right? So you think about, man, I haven't killed anybody, so I must be righteous. And what Jesus says is, no, you're not righteous. Let me tell you what this law actually means. Let me impress upon you where this goes in my kingdom. I want you to know that you are not righteous. I am righteous. You are not good. I am good. And I'm going to show you by some various different ways. And so if you've hung around sitting on a hill at all, you've heard this term gospel fluency. And so he's teaching us gospel fluency so that as we start to see the byproduct of worshiping something different or sin, anger, we as a community can speak the gospel into that. Or when we start to see the byproduct of sin, self-righteousness, I'm good, my brother can come say, hey man, I know that you haven't murdered anybody, but that chick on 270, as you were driving up to preach the sermon, who flipped you off for no apparent reason, yeah, you murdered her. I'm from the city, man. That's the, hey, I, I took out the proverbial Glock and pop, 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 
as she was throwing the finger up to me as I'm driving up here, trying to be worshipful. That's funny. Y'all are going to laugh. Right, uh, I, I didn't actually shoot her. Let me, that was proverbial, the, the fake one, right? And so he's trying to teach us gospel fluency. But in the same sense, he's trying to show us where in the Old Testament, where the Old Testament points to him. And so I have this quote. It's going to come up here. And I want this to kind of be the frame in which we dive into Jesus' teaching. It says the Old Testament brings forth a literary beauty. So there's not a liberal scholar on the planet that doesn't look at the Bible and go, this Bible is beautiful in all of the things that it does. It's a literary quality. A masterfully told story climaxing at the death of a hero. That's Jesus. And continued through the lives of the villains. That's us. Until the hero returns. And so I've been trying to keep up with the sermon series. And I've heard Tim about three times say, I've heard, we want to read the Bible correctly. We want to learn how to read the Bible correctly. We want to know how to read the Bible correctly. Because it's, it's difficult, right? Especially if you read the, the King James Version. Nobody understands that. No one. But it's difficult. But when you read the Bible, this is how you should read the Bible. There's one hero. His name is Jesus. He's the glorious king. He's the king of kings. And we in our sinful hearts are the villains every time. Every time. So when we read Hosea, you're not the righteous king to go out and marry the prostitute. Jesus says whore about seven times in the first three verses. We're going to talk about sex today, so I figured why not? Let's talk about Hosea. You got the Facebook, the, the, the worry, the, you know, we're going to talk about it. That's pointing to Jesus because we're the whore in that story. When we see all the, the failed kings, they're pointing to Jesus because he's the king that doesn't fail. The Moabites... The Philistines, the Amorites, all those cats, that's you in your sinfulness. The Canaanites, the worst of them all. God tries to, tries to get Israel to kill them like three or four times. They never get the job done. That's us. Right before the flood, when, Jesus, when, when God looks down and he says, I can't stand what I've created. Look at them, they're horrible. There's not a good thing about them. In our sin, that's us. And so when we read the Bible, we have to, make, we have to start to understand who we are in light of who Jesus is. And I'm going to bring this up. Is everybody familiar with the cross chart? All right, remember? Remember? Interaction? We've got to have that. I want to see smiles. Yes? Cross chart? I didn't even ask two questions there and expect you to raise your hand. So the cross chart you're going to see this, we call this discipleship at City on a Hill. The cross chart is beautiful because what we find is is that when Jesus has come and he's gripped our hearts, when the Holy Spirit has come in and, and he's softened our hearts and the, the glories of the gospel start to become real, we see the cross as a smaller version of the cross. And then as we go throughout our day and we recognize that we get angry over emails, or the lady that's driving behind us giving us the number one symbol, because I'm sure she wasn't flipping me off. She was just telling me I was number one. She's prepping me for my sermon. <laughs> or, the, or the boss who never shows up to work. When we start to get angry about those things, we can start to preach the gospel, and we start to see our sinfulness, that we are no, no, nowhere near the hero of the story. In the light of what Jesus is teaching, we are actually far more rebellious and far more villains than we expect. And so as we preach the gospel and we start to hear that Jesus is the hero and Jesus is the Savior and Jesus promises beautiful things, and we start to feel that because the Spirit is moving inside of us and we're changing Little by little, we call that sanctification. When we start to see that, we see that the cross gets bigger. Our need for Jesus gets bigger. 
And so when we hear the sermons and we read our Bibles, when we hear all of those things, we see that Jesus is a much greater hero in his story than we are a villain in his story. And this continues until we die or Jesus comes back. The cross be, continues to get magnified and it gets bigger. And that's why when, when Tim comes up here and he says, all I'm going to do is preach a big Jesus. Guess what today's sermon's on? It's a big Jesus. I got one sermon. It's a big Jesus. It's because this is literally what Christianity and disciple is, discipleship is. It's seeing the cross. It's seeing the climax of the story in a bigger way. It's seeing who we are in light of Christ. And it's becoming disgusted with that old man, as Paul says. Because when we start to see and we start to feel and we start to experience the joy of Jesus then those sinful things that were attracting us earlier, they've lost their taste. They've lost their salt. They're no good. Because when you have Jesus, and you, you could tangibly know that he's there, it's far greater than the other things that are holding you back, the sin. And so last week it was anger. And this week we're going to talk about lust. We're in uh, Matthew 5, verses 27 through 30. Um, if you want to get out your Bibles, if you are a phone person, um, my name is Adam Sloggett. I, uh, I do write some notes on version here recently. And so if you want to see kind of where uh, my studies are, I encourage you to follow me and, and, and we're trying out this version thing. I have not been engaging it so much, but I'd love to see you on there. So encouraged. Uh, Kayla, uh, Kayla um, as I'm reading through who's doing their, you know, looking at where people are at in their Bibles, you just see her just nailing Scripture, and she shared that today that, uh, that, that, that the Spirit is pushing her and driving her into the Word, and she feels, she feels so good with the, the Scripture and the prayer. And you can see that it's encouraging. It's uplifting in the world of social media that I don't know if not so uplifting, right? No, okay. You guys, you guys are uplifted by Facebook? Villains, you're the villains of the story. Goodness. And so I want to say a couple of things real quick before we drive, dive into the scripture. We are talking about sex. And the church needs to talk about sex. Like this needs to be a conversation in the church. I was talking with a lady the other day, and uh, she had had that, that conversation with a daughter. You want to guess how old? Eleven. Eleven years old, and her daughter was talking about, uh, about it. So here's the reality, church. Someone is communicating with you and with your children about sex be it the TV or the magazines, be it the radio or the Justin Timberlake songs, or the Cupid Shuffle is what we started today's service off with. And so if we're not going to talk about sex, then what's going to end up happening is that the world's going to describe what sex is supposed to look like to us. If we're not going to talk about sex, openly and honestly what's going to happen is, is our worship is going to turn sex into something incorrect and so I want to paint this picture for you in the beginning so Genesis if you're new to the Bible in the beginning God creates the world in six days right and at the very end of creation he creates Adam and Eve it's the height it's the apex of all of his creation. Everything builds up to the creation of humans, and he creates them very differently. He, he molds them with his hands. He creates them in his image. That's you and me. That's the, that's the not yet believer out here. He's molding us. We find out in, in the womb he's knitting us, that he knows each and every hair on our head. 
and then he breathes life into us. It's the only thing in creation that's, that's created that way. And it's beautiful. He says, it's very good. This is the, the apex of my creation. And then he says, I'm going to give them dominion. And that's where we get that creativeness, that salt that we talked about. And so what happens is that when the Spirit starts to move in us, when we start to understand and identify what our worship is, we're going to start to see the beautifulness in the Imago Dei. That's the, that's the, the image of God that we're created in. And unfortunately, what's happened with sin is we've taken the image of God in which he created, which he said was very beautiful, and we've distorted it in ways that, that are, are not worshipful. They're not good. But I want to implore you, church, I want to encourage you that our bodies as, as human beings are beautiful, that they're created in God's image. And unfortunately, the church, as it's gone through its, its moralistic period, sometimes called Christendom, is that they've distorted that. They didn't, they didn't want anything to do with the sex conversation because somewhere along the line, we said there's three things that we don't talk about in proper society. What are they? Religion? Oh, okay. we like to talk about religion. Okay. Politics. We can leave politics on the side. I don't want to talk about that. You're just going to make me mad and I'm going to murder everybody. And then sex. We don't talk about sex. And the church took this stance. We've even gone so far as to say that women can't come into the church unless they have long skirts and full sleeves. If you want to go farther, let's get the head coverings on. We've said men have to dress a certain way, and if they don't, then don't come into church. And this is something that Paul dealt with. This is a reality. The church said, eh, we don't want to deal with this. And so we've gone to what? Shame. Right? Right? Women, yeah, every woman should be just shaking your head, yes. When I found out how women's pant sizes worked, I was appalled. I was about to start writing some letters. It was ridiculous. I'm not kidding. Men, I know you're like, what? I don't know what you're talking about. I'll explain it to you later. It's why the dressing room takes like 35 minutes. No joke. Men, you're in the same way. Except it's a little more insidious with men because the world has actually told us that men can walk around half naked. It's okay. But we're going to get to that here in a second. And so the other thing the church has demonized is sex. They said, we don't want to talk about it. We don't want anything to do with it. And what the church really said is that as long as you're not committing adultery and it's not in front of everybody, as long as the pastor's not running off with, with a piano player, Josh and I are never going to have that happen. True story. Then we don't want to deal with it. We don't want to hear about your struggles. We don't want to hear about the things that are going on in your lives. And sex is a personal thing, and you keep that in your bedroom. And what that communicated to the entire church is that we, what we want you to do is we want to hide your sexual sin. We don't want to deal with it, so you keep it personal. And whatever you're doing in your room is with you. And then we've gone so far as to say that it's, as long as you're not hurting anybody else, we're really not going to engage that. You see how sin kind of continues to cascade in that? And the interesting thing part, the interesting part about it is in Genesis, God said, okay, I've created man and a woman, and they're naked. And then I'm going to command them to be Fruitful and multiply. And so if we understand our, our theology right, and we understand what's going to happen when we come back to the Garden of Eden, where we'll be worshiping God for all eternity, and we understand that was, what was happening there in Genesis, we see that sex was a, an art of worship, that God had commanded us, and we were being obedient in our worship, and so we were going to create, and we were going to multiply, and we were going to be fruitful, and we were going to tend with these things, and it was beautiful. God said it was very good. This is where the church says, amen. 
Like the married folks should be in here high-fiving. The goal is, is that you're like, look, it's worshipful to go back to our homes and make this thing happen. God commanded it. Adam said so. Here you go. And so that's the framework with I want to start the sermon. I told you three hours. I can do it for a long time. Y'all are getting better with the, with the reaction, so we might cut it down to an hour and a half. So I'm going to read the scripture, and we're going to walk it out. Matthew 5, verses 27 through 30. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. Old Testament. But I say to you, villain, that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Verse 29, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out. Throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go to hell. The encouraging words of the Lord. I'm telling you. So it's a funny story. I, when I was a first, when I first became a believer, I was going to a church that may or may not have been preaching the gospel. We're just going to call it not preaching the gospel. And the pastor got up, and and within like a three-hour sermon, literally a three-hour sermon, he starts to preach this: that if you're if you're lusting, that you need to start cutting members off. And I can remember thinking, oh boy, this is Christianity, huh? <laughs> I don't know about all that. I grew up Catholic, bro. (laughs) You're killing me with this. It's tough. But Jesus is speaking to our hearts. And Dr. Dr. G.K. Moody says this, and this this is how I want you to kind of view what we're going to talk about for the rest of the time. He says, lust is the devil's counterfeit for love. I'll actually throw in sin's counterfeit for love. There is nothing more beautiful on earth than pure love. And there is nothing so blighting as lust. That word blighting means terrible, awful. Moody was an old dude. So Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. And we already talked about this a little bit, but I want you to to hear it again. What he's saying is the Old Testament said, don't sleep with somebody else's wife. If you're married, don't go out and do this. And there's some dudes in here that are like, in your heart, and women, in your heart, when you hear, do not commit adultery, you say, that was me today. One point for me on my way to heaven. That's the way that our sinful hearts hear that. It's a reality. It made me subconscious. But we hear, okay, I didn't commit adultery today. I was good. It's a good thing I worked with all dudes in my office today. No temptations. None. But then he goes on to say in verse 28, he says, But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his, with her in his heart. And so what Jesus is doing is he's intensifying the law of the Old Testament. He's saying, look, it's not just the cross the T's and the dot the I's, but I want you to start looking into your hearts. I want you to start discipling each other. I want you to dig deep into this. I want you to be engaged. Because I'm going to engage you on a different level than the law was going to engage you. What he's doing is he's interpreting the law for us. He's saying, church, You've been failing at this for the last 3,000 years. Over and over and over and over again. You've been failing. But I'm going to empower you. I'm going to die on a cross for you. I'm going to send my Holy Spirit for you. I'm going to defeat sin for you. Smiles need to come on your face when you hear, I'm going to defeat sin for you. 
And then I'm going to be resurrected. And the death that you deserved, you're going to get life. And then I'm going to ascend into heaven and I'm going to sit at the right hand of the Father. And I'm going to pray for you. He's saying that's the reality here. I want to hit your heart so you know what's going on. And so as I was prepping for this sermon, I found three areas that I could think of uh, in which which lust gets us. Three areas. Now I'm sure that there's more. I'm sure that your villainous sinful hearts can find other different ways. But I think I got most of them. Yeah. The first one's physical. We see that physical lust is the the main one that we see in the church, right? It's the one we hammer on. It's the one we go after. It's the one that's most visible. So here's my encouragement, church. That the, the sexual drive that man and woman have for each other in the covenant of marriage is God-given It's healthy. It's appropriate. It's very good. Amen? Come on, guys. Like, if you're, again, if you're single in here, you're going to go, yeah, there's there's some good stuff in here. And if you're married, there should be high fives. Like I think so much of the church has, has tried to weed that out. We don't want to talk about that. That's good and that's healthy. We saw that in the, the Genesis story. It's good and it's healthy. We, we need to engage that. And so what we see is, is if it's truly worship, as I described earlier, then when we are worshiping and we're walking in the Spirit and, and we're praying continually like Paul asks us to do and we're engaging the world, we're going to see our wives differently. The Spirit's going to move in our heart. The cross is going to get bigger. The sex is going to get better. And we're going to connect on a very different level. Thank you. Because here's the reality, church, and this is just some practical um, advice. I know that most of you, some of you have heard me preach. Others of you have not. Um, but I do a lot of confessing in my, my sermons. Um, and so my wife is always on. She knows that she's going to get put in a sermon like all the time. Uh, because she's usually the target of my sin, unfortunately. So we're laying in bed Tuesday, and uh, we've been fighting. Not really fighting. If we're fighting, usually we're both A-type personalities, right? So when we fight, like it's a fight, you know, it's it's for real, and we don't mind doing it in front of you. So if you hang out with us for a while, you're gonna catch you're gonna, you're, you're gonna catch some of it back and forth. I'm I'm just letting you know, it's healthy for us. If we don't get it out, it it gets ugly and nasty. It's it's good for us to do that. So we're laying in bed, and uh, I just got done, and I'm working on this sermon and um, so we start talking about why we're not communicating and what, what we're going on and, and Taylor says well you know what uh, I feel like you don't love me and I'm like oh. it's like 10 o'clock are we really getting into this conversation like that's my that's my mind right I feel like you don't love me and I'm like, okay well you explain this to me and she's like well you we, we do our own things like she's in nursing school so she studies um, and we get to bed, the, the boy put down to bed. I have, a, I have a one-year-old son, Ezekiel. He's the cutest kid on the planet, and don't tell me otherwise. <laughs> and so we've got this one-year-old, and everybody knows who has one-year-old means that you, you, you that whole intimate thing for a little while has to get put on hold and, and breastfeeding and, you know, all of the different things that happen, right? Amen, this thing happens. And so Taylor and I got in a bad habit of is she would go and study in nursing school and I would go downstairs and I would open up my Bible or study something for work or do work or do something. Holy, holy, just so everybody knows. Like my downstairs time is, is pretty good. Um, and then I would come up and she's usually asleep and then I roll into bed and get out of bed about 6 o'clock the next morning. we do it over and over again. And what I didn't realize is that um, I wasn't pursuing her on a physical level that we had become routine and mundane in this, this just kind of living side by side. And what had happened out of that is that she started to feel as if, you know what, you don't want me anymore. 
and that, that doubt starts to sink in. Everybody knows that doubt when you don't feel like anyone wants you. And so, so in that doubt, she confessed. She said, and you know what? Um, because I don't feel wanted and be, because um, you, you haven't been showing me attention and, and because, because of these things, probably sinfully, I've been just being a jerk to you. And I hadn't really thought about it until, until we'd had this conversation. And my wicked heart was like, well, look at all these things that I do for you, you know? Like, I'm going to serve you. I want to do these things. And I said, okay, can you describe what it would look like for me to be more intimate, for me to touch you, for me to, to go through these things? Because we've been through this, this period now with, with the boy and, and, and going through all these parenting and all these, these real things. Church, we can talk about this. This is real things. And there was a period in time where the pregnancy, she just didn't want to be touched. I get it. You're kind of fat, you know, you're sweaty, like... Me. I, I gained 50 pounds, bro. Y'all thought I was talking about her. I was talking about me. Pregnancy weight's killer, man. I didn't want to. This thing here is on the rug? Okay. I got to get used to all this finagle stuff. At the Church of Bevo, I could just kind of walk around all over the place and walk up and down the aisles and stuff like that. It's crazy. Um, but yeah, so we, we had this, we had this talk and I'm in the middle of prepping for a sermon on, on lust. And I'm like, man, spirit, you're so good. I'm going to use this for a sermon. Maybe I should ask Taylor about this. But there's the reality is that when our physical affections are not turned towards a worshipful state with our wives in covenant marriage, it has disastrous effects for the rest of the things. It's no wonder that Paul, that Jesus, Paul, uses the imagery of a, of a wife and a husband for Christ in the church. This is, this is what, what, what God uses for the covenant relationship between Jesus and you. He wants it to be intimate. He wants it to be engaged. He wants it to be here. That's what he wants for our covenant marriages. It's why it's sitting on a hill if you get married. We as a family make a covenant oath that we're going to protect that marriage with everything. I know. Taylor and I got married right here. I was crying and bawling. It was craziness. I've cried like six times in my adult life, and I'm stumbling through it. It's ridiculous. But we as, a, we as a church take an oath and say, when you're married here, we're going to protect that marriage and that covenant marriage with everything. Because it's the, it's the most beautiful way that God displays his relationship with the church to the unbelieving or not yet believing world. And so here's the practical thing, church. As I'm a dude and I'm worshiping and I'm, 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 I'm praying in the Spirit and nobody's telling me I'm number one and I'm walking through and the girl walks by in yoga pants, Jesus, you're great, Jesus, you're great, you're great. That's how it happens. It's real talk. Jesus, you're great, Jesus, you're great, Jesus, you're great. Okay. What has happened there is my worship has turned from Jesus, you're great, to I am great, and I'm going to self-satisfy myself in my mind with whatever just walked by. I have said the Imago Dei, or the create God's creation, this beautiful thing that he's created in his image, is now an object. It's no wonder. It's no wonder. Go down to Walmart after this service, and just walk through the magazine aisle. We're all objectified. That's how the world goes through the pains and the, the trials and the tribulations. They objectify things so that we don't have to have real talk. So we don't have to have emotions. Nobody gets emotional over the chair. Right? Nobody gets emotional over objects. 
And so the world wants to keep us in this place. It's just a reality. You don't want to get emotional over a chair? Howard gets emotional over a chair. He's not in here now. But, bro, Howard, who does a wonderful thing here, everything is perfectly in line. Go ahead and mix, mix that up. See what happens. No joke. I wish he was. What's that? Is that what that is? And so we we ended up with an with an objectification. And so my encouragement, church, is that as we move out, that our prayer today is that we continually pray that we see the world, the people of the world, with the eyes that God has for them. That our hearts are stirred so much for Jesus, that our minds are stirred so much into what Christ has. That when we see the people in the world, that there might be that momentary sinfulness, but it's an immediate really met with repentance and recognizing that God has created something beautiful. And what we will find is as we go through that process is that that sinful initial look will get less and less. It will get less and less. And your relationship with your covenant wife will get more and more. And Jesus will continue to become bigger and bigger in your life. And it won't be easy but it's the work of the disciple. It's the work of the Christian to plead the Spirit to move us, to move us out of temptation. It's beautiful. A couple of pragmatic things within that. As a church, if we're going to talk about sex, it means we're going to repent about sex. We're going to repent about Uh, being lustful about things, and we're going to have to have some really awkward conversations. So here's, here's just a couple of things. Men and women, if you have to come and confess to your spouse about sex, you need to do it out of love, and you need to do it out of a recognition that this is going to hurt both of you. That there's going to be an emotional reaction to whoever was 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 in the wrong, whoever was sinning. And I want to encourage you that you need to explore those emotions and allow those emotions to go through you and see the glory of God in those emotions. So if you're deeply hurt, you can recognize that you're a child of God and He loves you even if your husband or wife is, has cheated on you with some pornography. If there's those emotions, you can see the beauty in those emotions. But you can't stay there. Because if you continually guilt and shame your significant other, if you rail your significant other, what you're teaching them or what you're discipling them is that they need to be a lot better at hiding their sexual sin. And that's a reality, church. If, if, if we want to be open and we want to be able to handle this, we have to recognize that we are all the villains in our sin. And that Jesus is the hero for all of us. And so I think women specifically have a hard time since um, statistically they're the most abused from, from this. And so my encouragement, women, is that when we come into this next portion of lust, that, that you recognize, because this is mainly pointed at you, that you recognize that, that lust is an is insidious devil. Because it doesn't just take form in the physical It also takes form in the emotional. Dude's emotional range like teaspoon, right? I already confessed I've cried like six times in my adult life. Taylor says I have two emotions, like medium or angry. Like that's that's it, right? But women have a huge complex emotional set, and it's beautiful. It's God-given. And what happens is, is when we're going through, the world has told us, that men are visual, right? And women are not. 
Men are visual, women are not. I think that's an absolute lie, and I don't agree with it. And I think this is ridiculous that men are running around half naked and our women are watching it and we're not protecting our wives. Fair, true. True story. Real talk. But here's the other thing that I think is is incredibly difficult. Lifetime for women. There's got to be at least a couple of women that are like, come on, mate, don't, don't hit my lifetime. How many of y'all watch Lifetime? Just curiosity. You don't watch Lifetime? Fantastic. This side of the room, villains. <laughs> this side of the room, <laughs> redeemed. So my mom loves Lifetime for women, right? And here's what Lifetime typically comes down to. Some egregious story that will never happen. Love affairs that shouldn't happen. And some crazy romantical romance that's just glorified like they don't have a one-year-old that's pooping his pants and running around and you know he's trying to get like the bleach out to drink it and you know you've got laundry that hasn't been done for like four days and the diaper pail's got to get empty and food's got to get made and it's 10 o'clock at night like that's not lifetime for women that's not But the insidious lie is that that emotional, that fake emotional attachment for our women can be what you want. And so when the reality of our lives hit and your kid's drinking Clorox and your husband's been down working on sermon prep, we start to lust after that. Our hearts get moved towards wanting that. Like I want Romeo and Fabio with the beautiful hair. That dude with the six-pack abs as he comes out of the, you know, uh, the swimming pool scene. Volleyball scene and Top Gun. Watch me kill that sacred cow, bro. <laughs> best, cinema, best cinematic flick ever on the planet. But women, do you, do you see where I'm coming from here? Do you see where the, the lust happens? It's real easy. Watch The Bachelor, Bachelorette if you want to see it play out. And complete. You watch The Bachelor and The Bachelorette, you will see what lust for women looks like when the world hands it to you on a platter. Real talk, though. And this is coming straight from a guy who's, whose wife watches this. <laughs> Real talk, though, are we protecting our wives? Are we protecting our wives with worship? Are we showing her what worship is when, when we're loving them well? And then we, are we able to say, look, sweetie, I'm going to talk into your heart right now. Is this moving you towards worship of Jesus, or is this taking you down a bad path? Because I, w I don't want you to hear churches. You need to run away from culture. Don't look at magazines and don't watch The Bachelorette or don't watch The Bachelor or don't watch Wife Time. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is as, as covenant members of a community, as people who are in love with each other, that want to see people flourish in Jesus and in the spirit move, are we calling each other to a set of holiness? And if in your heart of hearts the Spirit has not convicted you, you can say, absolutely, I can watch my Lifetime movies without any conviction, then hallelujah. But if you start to feel that twinge of conviction, it's the Spirit saying, hey, this is moving you down to a path. It may not be healthy. So protect each other. Disciple each other. Make the glorious name of Jesus singles. I've got one for you too. I'm not done. Circumstantial lust. I think this happens in singles more than anyone else, but it can also happen in couples. Circumstantial lust is simply this. I see that this marriage is beautiful and they have children and I want that. My brother has it all the time. If I only had a wife, my life would be better. If I only had a kid, my life would be better. I start lusting after those, those relationships or on vice versa. If I was single, my life would be better. I remember when I had money in the bank and I could do whatever I wanted. <laughs> this is a reality. We're going to be real talk, right? But that's a lustful in our heart. It's not ours. 
And so my encouragement with the singles is to go, look, Jesus is the greatest, and I'm going to worship him. And when I find someone who's worshiping him, we're both going to run to the cross, and we're going to do it in a community that love us, that stir our affections for Jesus, that make great the name of Jesus, because it's the most important thing in our lives. And so hear me, couples, and hear me, singles. The answer is Jesus. Greatest thing in our lives. Move in our hearts. Spirit, jack us full of this beautiful Jesus because we want to experience the blessings. We want to experience the joy. We want to be able to be communicative with Him. We want to know that God is God and we don't have to be God. Singles, couples, that's where we're at here. And that's what Jesus is calling us to. And so verses 29 and 30, as I wrap up this sermon, or Jesus going, let's get real radical about this. But unlike the pastor who preached, you need to cut, off your, cut out your eyes and cut off your hands and make me look like a blind torso over here by tomorrow. What I want you to see here is that Jesus is calling us to put our flesh to death. Because that, that sinful lust nature, those, those things that were wrapping around in your mind, didn't start with your eyes or your hands. They started with the worship of your heart and where your mind went. So you can cut off every part of your body. I'll see you in the ICU. I'll come pray with you. But it's not going to help. Every person I know that has been affected with pornography will tell you that there's images that are burned in their mind that they can see what they were looking at. Every single one. And so as we pray to the Lord that our, our minds get flushed out with the garbage that we've been watching and our hearts get turned towards worship to Him, there needs to be an extreme in which we start to put our sins to death. Here's the real talk. Because if we as a covenant community, as a city on a hill, as the, as the light in the darkness, really care about the people that do not yet know Jesus, if we really care about them, your brothers and your sisters and your moms and your friends, those people that are running through your mind right now, if we really care about them, then we absolutely care about the health of the church and the health of the members. We absolutely care about the health because we want to see Jesus glorified in each and every member. We want to see healthy people so that the world can see what a healthy marriage looks like when the divorce rate is over 50%. We want God to hear our prayers and to respond. Our leadership training, we talked about prayer this last bit and how God responds to the repentant. If you read all of the Old Testament, they don't repent. They ask for God and He turns a deaf ear. When they repent and they start to come to him and say that you are God and we are not, he comes back through and they see enormous blessings. And so if we care about each other, if we love each other, if we love the people that are going out there, we are putting sin to death. Too much of the Christian church is namby-pamby. Well, it's okay. We want to speak the go soft gospel. We don't want to dig into our heart. No, sin is affecting you. It's an affecting everything that's going on in your lives. It's time that we take John Piper's words and make war with our flesh. It's that time. But here's the reality, church. You can talk about Ephesians 6, and you can gear up, and you can put your army shirt on that says, I'm in the army of God, and, and you can buff up your muscles, and you can do all of the things. But if you're not walking in the Spirit, but if you're not engaging God in worship, if you're not prayerfully repenting and seeing that, that Jesus is much bigger, and He's the hero, and you're the villain, then you're going to get tired, and you're going to get burnt out. And when you're tired and you burn out, sin's crouching at the door. And it's going to catch you. And then we're going to do this over and over again. 
until there's a beautiful repentance and a beautiful spirit that will lead you away from temptation, that will give you the strength to continue the good fight, all those Paul, the Pauline metaphors that we love. And we can strap on all of that armor that we see in Ephesians 6, which is really just Jesus, and we can take our swords and we can swing that, which is really just the Scripture as we engage it, and the Spirit's going to move and the Spirit's going to change, and we're going to look like a different people. And we're going to experience God for real. It's going to be a daily thing. And then we're going to move out. And people are going to ask, why are we so joyful in the middle of our crappy jobs? Why are we so joyful? Why do we love Jesus so much? Why are we so radical about this religion? In the Arnold context, they're going to say, yeah, I go to church, but you're way different. I go to church on Sundays. But you seem to just constantly be engaged in this. And our prayer tonight is that out of that, that if city on a hill were to not exist, that the community would be affected. That the community would miss the fact that our church wasn't here that we would leave such a lasting legacy that the, that the, the entire Arnold area would be saturated with, with men and women who will go out and speak the good name, the good news of Jesus Christ. And it's beautiful. I catch all of the Soma things in that, that I get all of the things. I would be remiss before we pray, I would be remiss. I missed this about 45 minutes back there. If I didn't read you some alarming statistics. And this is the sin crouching at the door conversation. This is for uh, couples that are going to have married, teenagers, single people, however you want to deal with this. It probably should be a prayer list. So I got this from a secular site. This is stats on pornography. Because one out of three women in here statistically are engaged in watching pornography. That's up substantially. And three out of four men are engaged in pornography right now. If you're not in a DNA group, if you're not coming to a uh, missional community, engage us. Let's figure this thing out. So 12% of all websites are pornographic on the internet. Over $3,000 a second is spent on pornography. Can't feed the homeless, but we can spend it on pornography. 40 million Americans are regular visitors to porn sites. One out of three porn users are women. 70% of the men between the ages of 18 and 24 visit porn sites on a typical month. Here's the one that was outstanding to me. The average age for a child to see their first pornography Anybody want to guess? Eleven. Now, this did come from a secular source just so that nobody would claim that I was, you know, trying to bump these statistics. My last question for tonight. When do you think the most, the, 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 the most popular day for watching pornography is? Sunday. Sunday. The encouragement is the least popular day is Thanksgiving. So food wins every time, right? I'm telling you, there's something about this food. So let's pray and uh, 